The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it. We can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Well, greetings again, and it's really wonderful to see a few more of you here today. So I'd like to welcome everyone, whether you're here in person or online. Um, welcome, greetings. I've been thinking about the subject of spiritual adulthood, and I'd like to offer a few reflections and teachings on that subject today. Recently, one day, while I was walking to the meditation hall, I had one of those little fantasies that pops in and pops right out again, but it was of a bunch of children, six years old, seven, eight, all exchanging, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I imagined a six-year-old saying, well, I'm going to go sit alongside an active volcano and an interstate highway so I can learn to meditate and train myself for the benefit of all beings. <laughs> can you imagine anyone saying that? <laughs> no. But actually, some of us did grow up. We met someone who showed the truth. In my case, it was Reverend Master G.U. Kennett. And lo and behold, here we are, sitting alongside a volcano, looking at a wall. <laughs> so, as it turned out, what I wanted to be when I grew up, first of all, I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be a spiritual adult. And I'd like to, as I said, offer some teaching and reflection about what this means. Reverend Master Jiu used to describe Buddhism as a religion for spiritual adults. And I'd often kind of flinch hearing that, wondering with anxiety whether I would ever grow up in the sense that she was talking about. So I've been exploring what spiritual adulthood means and how can we practice it. Notice that word practice. Not how to have it, but how to practice it. So, what is spiritual adulthood? Think about ordinary human adulthood, and how do we recognize when someone has become an adult? There are certain signs the person has reached their full growth, maybe they've finished their education, they're no longer dependent on mom and dad, but provide for their own livelihood, Perhaps they've even started a new family. There are certain milestone ages, such as 18 and 21, when a person has certain legal and social rights granted only to adults. But what about spiritual adulthood? Are there any signs by which we can recognize that a person has reached spiritual adulthood? Is it a stage of life that once attained is permanent? Or rather, is it an attitude of mind that includes certain qualities of temperament and modes of conduct? And I lean toward the latter view. As I see it, the emergence of this mature attitude of mind is what characterizes a person as a spiritual adult. Reverend Master Jiu was a spiritual adult. She left home and went to Asia in search of truth. She found what she knew to be true. She then devoted her life to sharing that truth with others. She knew who she was and what needed to be done, and she did it. Reverend Master was an extraordinary human being. However, the qualities that form the attitude of mind of a spiritual adult are available to all of us. And two of the qualities I'll talk about today are responsibility and self-reliance. 
So let's look at each of these with some examples and explanation. First, responsibility. To my mind, this is the primary attribute of a spiritual adult. In Reverend Master Jiu's words, Buddhism teaches responsibility. You are responsible for you. You are responsible for everything you do. There is nobody who is going to take the fall for you. You have to be an adult. You have to be responsible. So she makes that pretty clear. It's up to you. The word responsible means a few things, including able to answer for one's conduct and obligations. Reverend Master Jiu's teaching on spiritual adulthood, cited in the book Roar of the Tigress, centers on the importance of knowing that our actions carry consequences. Helpful actions bring positive consequences or merit. Harmful actions bring suffering. Repeat, our actions carry consequences. This is due to karma, the law of the universe governing moral cause and effect. The law of karma is so profound that it is said that only a Buddha can understand it completely. So don't worry if you find it puzzling at times. That's OK. Ordinary daily life can show us how it works. Take a moment to think of a time when you've done something helpful and recall the positive feeling that came out of that. Or think of a time when you acted in haste or anger and recall the remorse, the remorse you felt or may still feel. Reverend Master Jiu often advised us to do your own training. Part of the meaning of this is not to worry about what other people do, but to take extraordinary care of what we ourselves do. This sounds obvious. It is obvious. But just look at the news or go to a cafe for a while and observe. Watch your mind. Can you catch yourself caught in thoughts of what the governor or the president should or should not have done? And what was that woman thinking when she put on that purple and chartreuse polka dot shirt? <laughs> and could you then think instead, that is something not to be done by me? Learning instead of judging, using wise discernment. Doing your own training does not suggest standing by, observing from a window, while someone is being mugged in the street below and not calling the police or shouting because it's none of your business. It means that each of us is responsible for cleaning up our own mess and not that we should never offer help. So what to do when something isn't right? Anything that strikes us as wrong. Injustice, abuse, a slight from a coworker, Another meaning of the word responsible is the ability to choose for ourselves between right and wrong. Yet the scripture rules for meditation instructs us to think of neither good nor evil, consider neither right nor wrong. To me, this means not using the judgmental discriminatory mind, the mind that judges harshly to determine right or wrong. Instead, from the stillness of the mind of meditation, wise discernment allows us to know for ourselves, to be responsible for, ceasing from evil, doing only good, and doing good for others. Reverend Master Jiu taught that being a Buddhist doesn't imply being a doormat, as she put it. When the feeling of something being wrong arises, Instead of reacting, we can stop for a moment and consider whether it is good to respond in some way. And if so, what response would be helpful? Is it in keeping with the precepts? Does it help the situation or those involved? Will it cause suffering or remorse? Is it my wish to help or to hurt? 
Blame is a habit of mind that doesn't contribute to spiritual adulthood. Blame is, in fact, an obstacle to spiritual development as it stands in the way of seeing what we need to do about ourselves. As Reverend Master Jiu taught, you made the mess of you, you have to clean it up. This is in no way a put down. Everyone has a mess to clean up and the ability to do it. Here's an example of blame. I have a younger brother, and when we were children, he knew well in the way of younger brothers everywhere <laughs> how to tease me to the end of my tether and beyond. And sometimes I would react with a kick or a slap. When the consequence would come in the form of a reprimand, I had a habitual answer. He made me do it. I truly believed that he was the one responsible for my anger and my action. This is child mind. The focus on my brother's wrong action blocked the ability to feel remorse for my having hit or kicked him. And that remorse that we feel from doing harmful acts can serve to halt future impulses to repeat them, helping us to respond next time rather than react. When we cast blame, it obstructs our ability to feel that remorse and see what I need to do about myself. A story from the Dhammapada concerning a jealous teacher and a female lay disciple illustrates the Buddha's teaching on blame. And I know I've used this before, so forgive the repetition. I always need to hear something at least twice for it to sink in. At one time, there was a certain female lay disciple of a naked ascetic teacher named Patika. And naked asceticism was one of the practices done by ascetic religious people at the Buddha's time. This lay disciple began to hear her neighbors describing the wonderful teachings of the Buddha and desired to hear him preach the Dharma herself. Repeatedly, she asked Patika, may I go to hear the Buddha speak? And each time, he replied that she was not to do it. Finally, she was able to have her son invite the Buddha to their home. The son, however, reported this to Patika. The next morning early, Patika and the son hid in a back room of the house. The Buddha arrived in due time to receive Dana and offer teaching. When Patika heard his female disciple praise the Buddha, he burst into the room saying, Hag, you are lost for applauding this man thus. After reviling both the Buddha and the lay disciple, he then ran off. The lay disciple became so embarrassed by her former teacher's conduct that her mind became distracted and she was unable to give her attention to the Buddha's teaching. And so the Buddha then instructed her in the following verse. Let not one seek others faults left done and undone by them, but consider one's own deeds undone and done. Another translation of that is Dwell not on the faults and shortcomings of others. Instead, seek clarity about your own. And I like that, seek clarity about your own. It's not a put down. It's a way of training and learning and helping ourselves. Clearly, the jealous teacher was in the wrong. And yet, as the Buddha pointed out, the woman too was wrong to focus on another's misconduct, removing her attention from her own conduct, reacting rather than responding. Another aspect of spiritual adulthood, and I'd say this might be described as a subheading of responsibility, is self-reliance. A point of caution here the term self-reliance means reliance upon the true self, Buddha nature. 
It doesn't mean rugged individualism, and it doesn't mean one can do whatever one wants without regard to consequence. Buddhists take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Buddha is great truth that permeates the universe. Dharma is teaching that expresses that truth. Sangha is those who practice that truth. And in order to practice reliance on the truth self, I strongly recommend commitment to a steady meditation practice and the moral precepts in order to help us hear the still small voice of truth. An aspect of self-reliance is contained in a teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha to the Kalamas. And I'm sorry for my pronunciation, it may not be right. These were people who lived on a busy trade route, as we do, which brought many religious teachers to their door, each offering their own particular views. And this confused the Kalamas. Not knowing which teaching to follow, they asked the Buddha for his advice, and this was his teaching to him. Come, Kalamas, do not go upon what has been acquired by repeated hearing, nor upon tradition, nor upon rumor, nor upon what is in a scripture, nor upon surmise, nor upon an axiom, nor upon specious reasoning, nor upon a bias towards a notion that has been pondered over, nor upon another's seeming ability, nor upon the consideration the monk is our teacher. Kalamas, when you yourselves know these things are good, these things are not blamable, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to benefit and happiness. Enter on and abide in them. And that goes back to that definition of responsibility, the ability to know for oneself to, uh, what is right and what is wrong. Continuing to consider self-reliance, I'd like to begin by re reading a verse from great master Tozan Ryokai. Truly, I should not seek for the truth from others, for then it will be far from me. Now I am going alone. Everywhere I am able to meet him. He is me now. I am not him. When we understand this, we are instantaneously with the truth. This verse points to the self that is meant in mature spiritual self-reliance. That is, the true self, true nature, Buddha nature, whatever you choose to call it. This isn't our self-centered self or the child mind that sits at the center of the universe, knowing everything and wanting things its own way. We seek for the truth from others out of ignorance. Ignorance of the fact that we already have, or indeed are, that which we are seeking. Instead of recognizing and expressing our true nature, we create a duality between ourselves and others, thinking they have something that we lack and that we can get it from them. If only I read the right book, listen to the right Dharma talk, follow the right diet. After banging our head against this wall for some time, with any luck, we stop to see if there might be some other way. He is me describes surrender of the selfish self to something greater. The recognition that something greater is in charge and the willingness to follow it. What great master Dogen called dropping off of body and mind. And even while yielding the individual self-centered me to that something greater, I am not it. I'm still me and not me at the same time. And if this seems contradictory, remember we understand it in the mind of meditation. As Reverend Master Ji would say, I am not God and there is nothing in me that is not of God. There's no separation. And the minute I start seeking again, 
There's the small self thinking that it lacks something and that it's in charge and has to do something. And once again, I have to give it up. Although this momentary surrender of the small self isn't a happily ever after finish, what is ever finished? It opens a door through which we can catch a glimpse of the infinite. And each glimpse serves to bring us toward the cessation of suffering the bliss of nirvana. To conclude, let me share a poem from one of the early Buddhist nuns by the name of Mita. And I'll mention as an aside that although the poem refers to the monastic life, I give it the broader meaning of the life of practice. So Mita says, my mother always told me, be good and you'll get everything you ever wanted. Now I eat once a day and wear only a shaved head and double robe. It took some strength. It took some courage to try and see for myself. The younger me would never have believed. But these days I'm good without having to wonder whether anyone is watching or not. And those are some teachings and reflections on spiritual adulthood, and I hope you may find some of them helpful in your own lives. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha.